It's good to see you too. But I'm here for something really important. What do you know about Sword Court Excelsior? There's a book all about it in our library. Oh yeah, it's right there next to that book about the Ark of the Covenant. If you see a book about Atlantis or the Ring of Aeon, you've probably gone too far and need to turn around. My friends, I must now unfortunately welcome you to Power Rangers Operation Overdrive. Go, go, Power Rangers! I have not been looking forward to this. Unlike most of these seasons that I've had to review that were after I had stopped watching as a kid, I actually did decide to look at an episode or two of Operation Overdrive at one point. To say I was unimpressed would be an understatement. As always, the history of Power Rangers is an opinionated, biased look, and you are of course free to disagree with me. However, in my own opinion, Operation Overdrive is the absolute worst season of Power Rangers I have ever seen. Everything that has been wrong in previous seasons is clumped in here. The music is atrocious, the acting mixed at best, the pacing is awful, the fight scenes exemplifying the worst of the Kalish era, the team-up is saved only by the presence of the previous Rangers, and the characters are the absolute worst Rangers I've ever seen. However, that's just my opinion. It's okay if you like the series, but man oh man, I don't. I admit, I was probably too harsh with Turbo. I walked into it not wanting to like it, never liked the car theme as a kid, upset that they changed the cast, but there's a lot of good things about Turbo. The fight scenes were still awesome, the music glorious, and there were some really good episodes like Cars Attacks, which featured probably the best coda I've ever seen on an episode, a moral message that is so much more sophisticated than what I'd expect from Power Rangers that it still surprises me. Is this where we have our cozy heart-to-heart -heart talk and hug and become best friends and, and everything's great? Look, Jenny, I don't even know if I'd want to be your friend. You're mean, you're rude, and you alienate yourself from everybody. Hell, Turbo has one of the best finales of Power Rangers, and has an episode dedicated to Bulk and Skull's character development. Don't get me wrong, I'm still not fond of the season, but there's a lot to like about Turbo! There is not a lot to like with Overdrive. But let's start talking about the season itself, and it starts at rock bottom with the theme song. Remember how I said they wanted a rap song for Mystic Force? Well, that ended up being more hip-hop than rap, but oh, they got their rap song for Overdrive! Like five fingers reaching for the sky in five ways. Five heroes walking through the sun for five days. This is, simply put, one of the worst songs I've ever had to listen to. It's atonal. The lyrics don't go with the beat. The beat itself just grates on your mind every time you don't want it to. If this song was a person, I would strangle it, burn the body, and proudly declare to the world that I had done it, and no jury would convict me. The season begins with the two-parter kick into overdrive. The Kalish era had this bizarre thing where all the episodes in SPD were one-word titles, all the episodes in Mystic Force were two-word titles, and Overdrive three words. It's kinda cute and all, but it hardly makes for the stuff of great titles when you restrict yourself like that. Need I remind you that SPD's first and last episodes are named Beginnings and Endings, respectively. The opening scene is, well... Enjoy. I flew to Kuala Lumpur in a private passenger jet. Reclining seats, great food, and a very cute flight attendant. Welcome on board, Air Baron von Gerstein, my young friend. I'm afraid I have some very bad news. The pilot, me, is leaving. And then Ace Rimmer jumps out riding on an alligator and steals this guy's parachute. At least that's what I wish happened. In fact, it plays out in a similar way until this kid, Mac, falls out of his hammock. Yep, opening scene of the series, and it's a daydream as he reads a cheesy adventure novel. Spencer, any word from Dad? Why can't I ever go with him on any of his archaeological adventures? Or well, perhaps when you've mastered the hammock, sir. He's living in his father's mansion with Alfred here. In particular, Mac's father is looking for, and found, an ancient crown called the Corona Aurora. Unfortunately, Indiana Jones here forgot to actually try to pull a switch for this thing and sets off a booby trap. You know, you'd think ancient civilizations would just, I don't know, 
bury their long-forgotten artifacts and then collapse the cave they put them in. I mean, if they're capable of hollowing out caves and setting up big pitfalls like this and elaborate booby traps to prevent their capture, it would be far simpler to merely collapse a mountain on top of it. Hard for anybody to recover it if there's millions of tons of rock on top of it is all I'm saying. It's especially important because this particular booby trap sends a signal to other planets, waking up the villains Florius and Maltor. Tomb Raider here is named Andrew Hartford, and he also awakens a being called the Sentinel Knight, who gives him instructions on what to do because he screwed the pooch and woke up great evil with his treasure hunting. We cut to six months later in Hollywood, California, or rather Hollywood, New Zealand, and the set of a kick-ass Matrix ripoff. Here we meet Dax Lowe, and oh come on, what douchebag did that? He's a stuntman! Stuntmen are incredibly valuable in Hollywood! He wouldn't get his own damn chair like that, but they're not gonna mock him for it, mostly because they know he can kick their asses! Stuntmen get set on fire for crying out loud! You don't screw with them! Oh, but it's fortunate he has his own tiny chair, because Andrew Hartford has called upon him. Next, it's off to the Italian Grand Prix, and Veronica Robinson, also affectionately called Ronnie. Only her seventh race and already the Grand Championship? I don't think that's how that works. Also, if they're in Italy, why isn't the announcer speaking in Italian? Anyway, she too gets the little hologram book, this time inside of her championship cup. And naturally, being the winner of the race, there are no reporters running up to photograph her and interview her or anything. Also, this would have been really awkward if someone else had won the race. Next is Mission Impossible here, named Will Aston. He is a thief. Oh, not his character, sort of. I mean his actor. He is a piece of crap, and I feel no shame for that, and I will explain why later. Also, despite the Mission Impossible here, he apparently has never heard of sound detection since he starts expositing out loud. What's this? I thought I was recovering the stolen Corinthian diamonds for the museum. But instead, Hartford explains this was a test of his skill, and he was hired to go into his own vault. And finally, we cut to London, and what I presume to be the Torchwood Institute, as Tony Stark's robot arm thing has gone crazy and is shooting lasers everywhere. Its creator, Rose Ortiz, calmly walks off and shuts it off because the rest of her assistants are morons. Hello, Rose. I've read your papers on advanced nuclear robotic science. I'd like to hire you to kill Superman. All are brought to the mansion, and Mac awkwardly meets them all, not realizing that his dad has summoned them. Subsequently, Mac and Andrew are probably the worst at hiding their New Zealand accents. In fact, I'm not even sure why they're trying to hide them. Considering the series is about globetrotting and everything, there's no real need to have them based out of America. Even Mystic Force lets Xander actually keep his accent. Anyway, Mac and the butler, Spencer, listen in from a really crappy air vent on the second floor. Seriously, it's not even really an air vent, it's just a bunch of holes. Frankly, considering Hartford is supposed to be super rich, I wouldn't be surprised if he uses this to eavesdrop on people himself. Anyway, Hartford shows them footage of Moltor and Flurius arriving on Earth with their respective foot soldiers. He starts explaining that in another galaxy on the other side of the universe, uh, I assume that this information got passed on by the Space and Galaxy Rangers during some of their own travels throughout the universe, but then Rose interrupts, knowing the story herself. Moltor and Flurius. We tried to steal the Corona Aurora. The crown was so powerful, changed their appearance and sent them off to distant planets, imprisoning them in their own elements. Wow, the Corona Aurora really has a sense of humor. But really, the two should have known that would happen considering their names. It's a basic comic book rule. If your name sounds like anything, you will be a supervillain. Then again, Flurius and Moltor are kind of showmen in their own ways. <laughs> Mr. White Christmas, I'm Mr. Snow, I'm Mr. Icicle, I'm Mr. Ten Below, I'm Mr. Green Christmas, I'm Mr. Sun, I'm Mr. Heat Blister, I'm Mr. Hundred and One. So how does Rose know this? I took a year of ancient universal legends at Harvard. Oh yeah, I heard about that course. It was headed by the same guy who did the lecture series Universal Conquerors, from Lord Zed to Lothor. 
Hartford further explains that the Sentinel Knight, the Guardian of the Crown, took the five jewels that covered it and sent them off to a distant planet for safekeeping. You know, for a Guardian, he really kind of sucks at his job. He lets two guys manage to reach the thing, then instead of finding a better hiding spot for the Corona Aurora, or hell, even scattering the five jewels all over the universe, he puts them on one planet, Earth. Now this, this would make a great movie. I know this guy who knows the sister of a cousin of Spielberg's limo driver's aunt. Bet I could play you. And we see why Dax has not been offered the chance to play a lead. Hartford explains that he accidentally set Flurious and Moltor free, and who knows how many other villains are gonna come looking for the Corona Aurora. And as such, he needs their help protecting the crown and finding the other jewels before they do. You're rich, buy an army. An army can't stop them. Five teenagers with attitude, on the other hand. The four of you have the physical and mental qualities needed. A stuntman, a thief, an admittedly intelligent college professor, and a race car driver. You know, at least when Lightspeed Rescue recruited civilians, they at least had some rescue professionals in there. And I have the technology and the money to fight this evil. I can turn you into Power Rangers. Okay, then why not an army of rangers? Anyway, they start to leave because, well, it all sounds ridiculous, but then the Sentinel Knight appears in front of them to verify the story. Over to the villains as they respectively get their own headquarters, Flurius getting his own comic relief yeti by the name of Norg, while Moltor locates the crown at the mansion. Down in their basement, Hartford is given the team their team uniforms and is... Well, I'd better let them explain so there's no misunderstanding here. Now, as we speak, your body's physical and mental capabilities have been enhanced by a DNA resequencer. This is the source of their civilian powers this season. Our mentor character is screwing around with their DNA through genetic manipulation devices that he has in his freaking basement. I know it's been only a minute or two since I last showed that clip, but expect me to keep using it to illustrate this point. You're rich, buy an army. I mean, we don't even get a token explanation for why we can only have these people as rangers. Or hell, hire mercenaries and have them at least get the genetic enhancements so they can provide support. Now, most of you would respond, well, we can't have mercenaries in a children's show. To which I say, don't write your story with plot holes that even a child could see through. That being said, Andrew says he's not going to let them do anything that he wouldn't do himself. Thus, he will be the Red Ranger and steps in to get his genes scrambled too. However, before he has the chance to become the subject of a David Cronenberg movie, Max steps out of the elevator and wonders what the hell is going on. Great security there, Hartford. Starting to think Will Aston didn't have to do very much to break into your vault. Mac volunteers to join the team, wanting to help, but Hartford is against it. Not sure why the hell he kept it a secret, or how he expected to keep it a secret, but that's the tiniest of holes in this premise. The rest of the Rangers go topside and try to figure out their powers. Will discovers them first with enhanced hearing and telescopic vision. It's telescopular. Telescopular? That's not a word. Maybe not, but that's what it is. You are an idiot. Moltor's forces launch an attack, and the four are quickly tossed around. Will and Dax, being the ones with actual experience in physical activity, do better than the others. At least until the civilian powers kick in. Ronnie gets super speed, Dax super agility, with laser sound effects when he kicks people, of course. And Rose can turn invisible. You know, you'd think if he can manipulate their DNA to give them superpowers, he would give them all the same varied powers. Versatility is all I'm saying. The group retreats on vehicles, presumably with the crown with them, and they run into Flurius' forces, also sent to retrieve the crown. Hartford gives them their morphers, called overdrive trackers, and tells them that the activation phrase is overdrive accelerate. He's about to join them, but Max stops him once again, declaring he wants to help. Hartford tries once again to join the group, but the other foot soldiers arrive and make him drop the morpher. Mac quickly grabs it and morphs. Overdrive! Accelerate! Speaking phonetically! Anyway, at first I didn't like the morphing sequence, but it's grown on me. What has not grown on me is the outfit. 
As always, it's a matter of opinion, and I know plenty of people who like the Ranger outfits this season, but I cannot stand them. What does it in for me is all the chrome. I think I'd actually be okay with these if not for the damn chrome shoulder pads and gauntlet ends. Why do they need those shoulder pads? It clashes with the general aesthetic of the outfit. If they had shields like a lot of Sixth Rangers tend to have, that'd be something. But instead, it's just this big chrome rectangle attached to the outfit, and it looks awful. And of course, there's the Overdrive logo, which resembles a compass. It makes sense considering the treasure hunt motif of the season, but it looks like a big corporate branding right on their chest. It just looks ugly, like a lot of those chest insignias on Ranger uniforms tend to do. It works for an individual superhero, not usually a team. Oh, and yes, Kalish explosions aplenty. Don't worry, I won't harp on them for five minutes like I've done before, but they move into the realm of completely incomprehensible this season as we suddenly have explosions that came from nowhere! No blasts, no energy, nothing to actually cause the explosion. Things just explode! And it is so very, very boring to watch when they do it so often in every episode. Someone actually did a count of them, apparently. At least 250 of these in the entire season. Moltor manages to get his hands on the crown and blasts what I have to presume is supposed to be a dormant volcano and activates it, unleashing the lava onto the nearby town to keep the rangers busy. The rangers want to go after the crown. Our heroes, everybody! Hartford has to insist that they actually go save people, with them only agreeing when he tells them it was a fake and not the real one that Maltor grabbed. I would point out that the temperature of hot lava should kill anyone that close to it, so these people in the streets should be dead already, but Power Rangers science. Speaking of, Will uses his hammer to create a trench to drain the lava in the middle of the street, which of course all drains away really insanely quickly. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, and the black guy is once again the Black Ranger. I guess in 2007 that was suddenly okay to do, but it wasn't okay to kick something unless it sounded like a laser. Hartford and the others compliment Mac on a job well done, but Hartford still takes away the morpher. Unfortunately, we get another example of the great Hartford security system, as Moltor is already behind him and gets away with both him and the real crown. Mac is naturally depressed about not getting to be a ranger. My father's kept me sheltered my whole life. And now the one chance I have to prove myself, I do. And he takes it away. Spencer says that the only thing his father is afraid of is his losing him and wants him to be safe. That being said, there's a clever bit of foreshadowing here. So if sometimes you feel like just one of his possessions, remember that with all his wealth and his treasures, you are the one thing that to him is irreplaceable. Mac goes inside to talk to his dad, but he's still gone. Meanwhile, Moltor takes both Hartford and the crown to Flurius. Flurius assumes they'll be equal partners in finding the gems, but Moltor is already scheming for himself in the matter. The two are hoping that since Hartford was able to find the crown, he'd be able to locate the gems as well. Back at the command basement, they start using the resources in the place to search for Hartford, who is wearing a tracking device on his watch. And Mac wants to help, but his father was apparently able to put the morpher in the safe before he was taken. Fortunately, they have an expert safe cracker on the team, who's able to lift a thumbprint off a glass and uses it to fool the fingerprint reader. They locate Hartford's tracking signal and use their special vehicle called the Shark to get there. Once there, they start using their civilian powers to their advantage. I'll say this, the civilian powers this season are incredibly generic and unimaginative. Super strength, super speed, super agility, but at least they're using them effectively. Might be even more effective if you gave them to more than five people! When Hartford refuses to cooperate, Moltor throws him into a volcano. However, Dax manages to reach him in time and rescue him thanks to a grappling gun that he has now. After defeating Moltor in battle, they withdraw, but Moltor swears vengeance by trying to kill the inhabitants of the island they were on via a giant monster. As such, the rangers utilize the Drive Max Zords. Vehicles, of course, that form the Drive Max Megazord. People have asked why I haven't talked very much about the Zords themselves, and really it's because unless there's something unique or special about them, there isn't really much point. They start blending into each other after a while. That being said, the Drive Max Megazord has a shovel and 
pickaxe that can shovel dirt on a monster and then form into a sword. Ah, Power Rangers. Florius berates Moltor for his failure and demands he hand over the crown to him for safekeeping. When he refuses, the two get into a battle. Brother or no brother, it's every man for himself! Fine! In the end, Mac hands the Morpher over to his father, saying he respects his decision. However, Hartford hands it back to him, saying that perhaps it's time for him to make his own decisions. Mac undergoes the DNA resequencing, and he seems to have super strength. Listen up, Rangers. It's time to get to work. Our enemies have the crown, and now they're going to be after the jewels. It's going to be the mission of Operation Overdrive to find them first. Yeah! Oh, and I'm sure you'll do a bang-up job of hanging on to them. I mean, you've done great so far. Kick into Overdrive reminds me very much of Operation Lightspeed, but without a lot of the grandeur that made it work. People from different fields, but experts in said fields, being called upon to become Power Rangers. Say for Mac, of course. Aside from the fact that Operation Lightspeed was a lot more dignified in talking about the honor and responsibility of becoming Power Rangers, the choices for Rangers made a lot more sense there. The least likely members of the team were Kelsey and Joel, but there were arguments to be made for both. Kelsey was an extreme sports athlete, which meant she was involved in a lot of on-her-feet thinking and physical activity that comes with being a Power Ranger. Joel was a stunt pilot and therefore probably had the most vehicle certification and experience in flight. Considering Ronnie was practically drooling over the vehicles that she saw, she's probably meant to be the vehicle expert for this team, but there's a big difference between planes and race cars. And don't get me wrong, race car drivers require a lot of knowledge and skills themselves, it's just driving a car and flying Flying a plane are very different things. Yet Ronnie was skilled in piloting the shark, and her qualifications for rangerhood are drives cars faster than other people. Dax's experience is as a stuntman, and while he clearly has knowledge of martial arts and parkour, stunt fighting is not the same thing as real fighting. If you wanted someone trained in those areas, why not get an actual athlete? The bigger issues overall with the episodes are a sense of been there, done that with these character dynamics and plot. We've already seen the Sun slash Other Ranger doesn't want Red Ranger to be Red Ranger handled in Time Force and done a lot better since the issues seen here were pretty much resolved right off the bat while they took half a season to develop and work on in Time Force. And they didn't have the problem of trying to hide their accents while they were acting. The villains aren't particularly compelling so far, just two evil forces wanting the Corona Aurora because evil. We're not given any info on the Sentinel Knight, not even his name, but I decided to give it early just for ease of summary. Or how the hell he's just a big glowing ghost. The Morphers are neat. One could mistake them for cell phones, but they open differently than most phones, and the morphing is activated by flipping the cover to the side, spinning a wheel, usually on a metal surface for friction, and then projecting the energy out in a little hologram thingy. I mean, they're not just tapping three numbers on their phone and bam, Ranger mode. It's kind of clever, I like it. 